<clears throat> All right. So I am here with Kay Kenyon, a extraordinary novelist, and we're going to talk about subplotting because this came up in one of the classes Kay was teaching recently, and we were like, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with subplots, but what do we need to say? So we thought we'd sit down and talk about subplots because, uh, as I was just saying to Kay, I think people, when they sit down to write a novel, are like, I know I got to have them, but I'm not sure where to get them or how to put them in. So let's kind of talk about what subplots are, perhaps, to start with. Okay, you want to take a stab at a definition? Well, I'll take a stab. Um, a subplot is um, a plot thread that is not your main thrust of the plot. It may be a different person. It may be um, a different problem. And they may come together at some point uh, early or late. Uh, but it's kind of a, um, under that definition, you could have many, many subplots. <laughs> so part of what we'll have to talk about is um, when they're really useful and, and when they might overwhelm. Well, let's talk about that. When are, when are they useful and when can you have too many? Because you obviously can. How do you, actually we'll tackle that later, kind of how you might know. So but like, mm -hmm. when, when is one useful? What does it do? Well, I'll toss that back to you, Kat. What <laughs> you have a, you have a novel you said you're working on that has a lot of them. How how did you find that necessary for your book? So with the one that I'm working on right now, it's omniscient point of view. So and it's the crew of a spaceship. So there's actually I want to say uh, eight POVs, but mm -hmm. I've chosen I think five or six of those to to focus on. Um, and so the overarching plot is sort of as a crew, kind of as a group entity, they have uh, threats to their survival uh, that they have to overcome. But at the same time, uh, each of them has internal things uh, that they need to overcome or deal with in order for that overall plot to take place. Uh, one of the characters is dealing with the death of a family member and for them to get out of the fix that they're in at the end for him to kind of pull his weight in that solution he has to come to terms uh, with that death which he does in a very unusual way here there's tantal tantalizing hints uh, but, but does that make sense yes and it sounds like an ideal situation to have a number of subplots because it sounds like they're all going to be in the same place mm -hmm. and you've got so much flexibility to trade off viewpoints and they're all kind of well in a spaceship they're traveling they're all on the journey together and there are other kinds of novels where um the the different characters carrying subplots are very far removed mm -hmm. or or they have their own um arc but then it coincidentally crosses and meshes with the main arc at some point and will become um, a surprise uh, forwarding of the main plot. But what you've got is um, a perfect opportunity to have a, um, a group of uh, ensemble actors. And that's, there's so much fun. I mean, it's, it's like, watching a movie with a bunch of characters that you really love and, and there's a lot of banter and fast action mm -hmm. and i think i think that one of the things that makes subplots uh interesting you use the word enrich and, and deepen and i think that is something that subplots really do um you're they, talking about and when i teach my plotting class you know, just just a minute ago you said you oh. talked about subplots uh <laughs> enriching things Oh. And, and I think that they do. I, I think that uh, sometimes they can show uh, the consequences, right? Uh, if something goes wrong in the overall action, right? They can kind of show you all the possible uh, consequences. Um, they can make that, uh, 
main plot line more difficult by adding in opposing goals. Uh, let's say your protagonist's best friend wants something utterly at odds. Uh, how do they come to terms with that? Mm -hmm. And the uh, antagonist can have a subplot as well. So oh, that absolutely. you see them, two ships, cruising toward each other in the fog, you know, they're gonna, you know, uh, but it, it gives the, it's a fun thing to play with when you, when you have um, important subplots that the main character is not aware of. Oh, yeah. so the reader is ahead of the main character in that sense, which is, uh, I think, technically called irony, but uh, it, it allows for some fun, um, ways to engage the reader in in the story because the reader uh has a different perspective than the main character which is odd you know that's an yeah. odd one but it's fun it's very fun because oh no don't go in that room because they know what's in that room that's good well and it's, uh, it's pleasurable right we like being the one in the know and so it's it's fun to sort of be more clued in than your protection and you know, especially um, our specialty being science fiction and fantasy. I mean, there, there's a a genre where it's especially useful to have subplots because talk about deepening. You deepen the world by showing different segments of society, mm -hmm. different um, segments of privilege, and and different cultures. And uh, uh, it's very hard to show those things unless you're in somebody's point of view who's actually experiencing that um, difference or that hierarchy. So uh, I think, and especially in epic stories, you almost have to have very important subplots in order to carry all of that uh, richness. Yeah. But even in a smaller, uh, uh, more limited frame for science fiction or fantasy novel. I think subplots, I mean, you're always in a world. Uh -huh. So you, you want to show that because this was one of the reasons people come to science fiction and fantasy is show me the world. That's it. We want to, we want to escape into it and be in this world that's, that's unlike our own and, and very interesting and full of cool stuff. And you know, the cool stuff can't just be hardware. I mean, the cool stuff is always people. Yeah, it's and, a big, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah so the, the cool stuff that I like in science fiction and fantasy for subplots is the cultures. Yeah. You know, show me a different aspect of the culture. Make me believe that, you know, that this is a real place. Uh, who's up and who's down? There's always power, questions of power in, in you know, even in a mundane story. But in science fiction and fantasy, you want, you want to have that sense because we know there's an elite we know there's often a subject subjugated class or two even an unconsciously subjugated class or two so it's very it's very fun to play with well we're into world building but just to finish out the thought but um sometimes the culture denies what they're doing mm -hmm. and so what the culture hides and what the culture refuses to see are things that can be brought out through uh, very vividly through subplots. Right. right. Yeah. But uh, how do we, um, how do we, how do we know when we've got a subplot that adds or actually kind of weighs things down? You know that feeling you have when you're reading a book and then the, the, the point of view changes and you go, oh darn, because I was with this person, you know, and now I'm not, and now I don't like this person that much, you know, and, and then they repeat. So usually a subplot, but they won't come in just once. Uh, that's just a point of view departure, you know, but a subplot has, you know, continuing uh, thread. And uh, I'm always aware that readers tend to dislike abrupt, uh, well, they just, they can dislike changing viewpoints. They can feel annoyed by it. But since subplots are kind of inevitable and they bring so much else to to the fair that I think readers ultimately forgive you. But I, I do think that once you get a subplot going and you realize even you are bored with it. <laughs> right, right. 
time to get rid of it, even though you were kind of chasing something with it. Well, Not all subplots are golden. I think that for a subplot to really be interesting, it needs to do something unexpected. I mean, it just like most plots, but it also, I think if it, you want something that hopefully raises the stakes in some way for the larger plot, or that kind of changes something for the larger plot. Perhaps it accelerates the timetable. Uh, maybe it makes the stakes higher. Uh, maybe it makes the stakes more complicated. Uh, but I think that the question of, of kind of like when can you have too many subplots is when they become more important than the main plot. Right, you want them, just as with a symphony, you have that kind of main song line, you want everything sort of enhancing that rather than sort of going off in its own direction. Does that make sense? It does, I, I, I do think we have to be watchful for that. And um, one of the ways to be watchful is to think about momentum. Um, at what point in the story are the number of subplots you've got slowing things down so much that the reader is starting to feel um, that we're not going anywhere. Yeah. Because the reader knows uh, at some level, and maybe uh, obviously, that there is a story problem. Mm -hmm. And let's say we've got eight different viewpoints for that story problem, just, just for giggles. Um, at some point, I'm going to get tired of by the third or fourth person experiencing that same thing, or even a few days ahead. It, it, it almost inevitably slows momentum. Now, not necessarily if you've got, let's say, two subplots. You might not get into so much trouble, but, but even so, uh, let's say you've got a second subplot that's almost as strong as your main. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've got the same problem of slowing the, slowing the momentum of the story. In other words, pacing which I talk about in one of my, <laughs> one of my workshops um, that I do for the Rambo Academy of Wayward Writers. Um, which, which actually, I ended up rethinking a lot of my scenes. I'm going to go back and, and uh, kind of reevaluate them because I think you're absolutely right that there has to be this, that the men momentum is the key thing. And we do lose momentum every time we shift point of view because we have to take that moment to say to the reader, okay, you're no longer in that point of view. Here are the things that are different. Here's the world. Here are the things that distinguish uh, this particular viewpoint. I mean, it's almost like you're kind of bouncing them from one funhouse ride to another and mm -hmm. your, your aim is to buckle them into the new segment of the ride as fast and, and painlessly as possible. One of the uh, things that tends not to slow momentum too much is when you've got a strong antagonist. Ah, yeah. And that brings home your point of a subplot is effective when it changes things for the worst. Um, so now the reader has the opportunity to see the worst being planned, uh -huh. the worst being tried out, the worst um, tiptoeing forward in the fog. Mm -hmm. And I think so, that's a good. You know, if it works out that you have a strong em embodied uh, antagonist as a as the force of opposition, right. but one of the things that um, you have to be careful of when you've just got two sub two plots one the main plot and the subplot is is making them equal in any way. I mean, we've kind of touched on this before, um, that you don't want to get in the way of your main story arc, but um, there's something funny that happens when you've got two plots. They just, it's like you, you, you cut something in the middle and it just goes like this. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, it's almost different when there are three because then there's a lot of braiding going on. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. two, two plots don't braid very well. I yeah. mean, they're just, things in succession and then you switch and then you're with the other one and um, I did read a story I can't forget what it was it wasn't in genre but it was a story where there were two protagonists there were two women in World War II and and they were one was a pilot and one was 
um, captured by the Nazis. And we kept switching back and forth and back and forth. And I thought, gosh, I'm reading two different stories. Yeah. So for me, it just went. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. So um, that's probably people wouldn't make that mistake. And in fact, I think it's sold like hotcakes. So maybe I don't know what I'm talking well, about. I, I think it is. I mean, one of the things that you want to do when you've got two points of view is, is for the reader not to be going, I don't understand why these two, or I don't understand how these two, I don't understand how they relate to each other. I think that's uh, confusing. I was. Uh, they'd have to be germane and they'd have to yeah. really deal with the same, the same plot. That's what annoyed me about the story is that they each had uh, an arc that was, uh -huh. important. and so I didn't know what story I was reading. I guess I'm just hardbound traditionalist. <laughs> well, I mean, we have story conventions that uh, are ingrained in us from childhood, right? Because we have mm -hmm. the children's books, which have very specific patterns. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, are there, are there things that you should do to make that if you've got more than two plots? Is there ways we, kn we know of to do that weaving artfully? I, I had the feeling that it was a matter of touch, you know. That, I, I, I think you're right. Or we chatted, but then I have the feeling you maybe have more experience than I do. No, I mean, you, you have written many more books than I have. And I, I, I think, though, I think uh, the subplots, there has to be that mirroring in every strand uh, where it's always kind of like, this is my subplot and it's mirroring the main plot from this angle. And here's my other subplot and it's mirroring the main plot from this angle. And, and I think, and I'm distinguishing this from say a book where you have three plots braided together tightly where each of them are kind of of equal importance. I'm assuming that there's always something that's, that's of main importance. But I think, uh, for example, one of the kind of classic subplots, I think, is a mirror of the consequences, where kind of you see somebody who is an example of what happened, what would happen if your protagonist fails. Uh, and then and it's a subplot where basically that person kind of gets redeemed by the end uh, mm -hmm. in that their horrible situation that they were brought to by their failure is addressed in some way. We get into a bit into theme um, mm -hmm. with your concept of mirroring, and I like it very much. Um, we see this, I think, in um, stories where the main character has two arcs. One is the main story problem arc, and the other is, well, one is where often this, this is a case of roles. They have a role, let's say the ship captain, right. and, and then they have a role as let's say daughter, mm -hmm. you know, scientist or something, and the scientist is aboard the ship or anyway. So then you have a chance to show what the major character is dealing with thematically, um, overreach, um, uh, held, held back from, by lack of self-confidence or whatever this inner, whatever the th thematic content is. And then it is played out in a, a different way in, in the secondary role they play that's shown in a subplot. You often see this with detective stories where right. the proficient, capable detective is home um, and is dealing with a version of the same thing that that he or she is dealing with the main plot. And uh, that has a double um, effect of you get deeper into your character because some, some roles are so strong, ship captain, detective. Oh, yeah. They have, you know, they have a power role and a role of leadership. But then let's say they come home and they're married and they're with their partner. And then there's a different role they have to play. And how does all of the other stuff play out at that level? So I think that that is, a you know, 
strictly mirroring <laughs> mm -hmm. in a way you're mirroring mirroring your your theme and not all stories have themes but i think if you find that you have a theme and usually once I'm into a story, a hundred pages or so, I, I know that there's kind of a theme emerging. Yeah. But hey, start writing a novel from a theme because it's like, then I'm going to, I've been, <laughs> then I'm going to lecture in some, in some fashion. But if I discover it, then I might want to go back and weave in yeah. uh, uh, one of my characters who can reflect that, that same theme. What would you die for? Uh, uh, protection of... Uh, under of the of, of children or what, whatever your yeah. your theme yeah. might be um but it still doesn't answer the question of how do you how do you decide when to to do the the next weave you know? uh -huh. and um do, do you are you finding with your your work in progress that it's working instinctively for you or do you have a, a plan for it I, so actually I have uh, uh, <laughs> the back of a closet door uh, covered with little index cards. Oh, do you, can you show it? Or I mean, actually, I, I can. Let me see if I can. Uh, avoid <laughs> but you can see. Oh, God. Uh, it's love... got, and so this is act one and then act two and act three. And what I've tried to do is uh, kind of identify those main sort of tent pole scenes, right? Where it's like big moments and big decisions and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then gone through with every character, I've, I've been like, okay, here is their thread. Uh, here, you know, this, this one is, is coming to terms with the grief. Uh, this one is coming to terms with a different kind of grief. Um, and kind of went through and tried to figure out what that arc look like in what its major moments were and where they happened in relation to those tent pole scenes. Does that make sense? Well, it, it does. And you're talking about actually, and I can see why it would be the case with the story you're working on that, that there's an arc mm -hmm. in the subplot. Uh, just to point out, well, we should pursue that a little more, but just to point out, there can be subplots that don't have an arc. You know, it's just like if you've got three or four subplots, it's it's too much to expect to show right. Right. that kind of a character change over time. Um, and I think eventually uh, it could collapse if you try to do that. But I mean, again, it's a matter of of um, of touch because some subplots just want to have an arc because yeah. yeah. you're like you're, you're showing how they're dealing with internal issues, especially those we want to see uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. but there also would be time in highly in, in commercial science fiction and fantasy where you're just showing uh, another um, uh, another uh, thread of the plot mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. going to come to bear on yours on the main plot. Uh, at some point, let's say it's a tool that will need to come uh, to the to the into the hands of the major character. So right. you're showing where it starts yeah. and how coincidentally they meet on the road, or or how they intentionally do. So, but they don't have an arc. So character arc is a choice. Yeah. Ah, here's a principle. Ah. Does your subplot want to have need to have an arc? Which That's means a great question. needs to be a bigger subplot than others so, you choose. So I will build on that and wonder if uh, we can distinguish between subplots that are centered on characters versus subplots that are centered on a place or event or object. I'm trying to think how an object could create a subplot, but I'm, I'm sure it Oh, I can think of one. Okay. I suppose the major character is struggling with a very thorny issue, which is um, encapsulated and um, lives in a computer, which if they had access to it, they could solve more easily the problem. And they meet someone who's a computer specialist 
who they rescue and befriend. And then that person comes back and says, by the way, I was fiddling around with my computer. And so this is a, this is a technical assist to the plot. You needed to have someone because your major character is a village girl or, or, or whatever, who has certain capacities that while you don't want a deus, deus ex machina kind of, right. you know, rescue, right. that, that, that certain tools and uh, abilities can come into their hands. Yeah. So yeah. it would be focused on computer or if, if you've got a MacGuffin, if you've got a object of desire, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that object of desire might pass from hand to hand. Uh, interestingly, uh, if it's part of your plot. Uh, so I, I do think that one of the reasons that we have subplots is to make the main plot work. Yes. Yes. Oh, if you have to have something come in that needs explanation, it can't just be sprung on people. Uh, it needs to have a provenance. It needs to have been somewhere. And now it comes in, it's this minor, even a minor subplot. I think, uh, yeah. Don't have the anvil just dropping out of the sky, have mm -hmm. the plane then, flying overhead. This is one of the main reasons I ever do a subplot, which is... Yeah. My main plot needs it. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good yeah. distinction. I got to have it. But tell me more about this idea that some are centered on character. Is there anything else you want to say about that? Well, I think, I think yeah. when you're talking about characters, then it is going to be more satisfying if you have a kind of a character arc where there's something that they have that changes about them. Uh, maybe their situation or maybe something internal. Um, Why again would we need um, another character with another arc? Because they mirror your main character in some way. They mirror the main, the main character or the main plot in or some the way. Main plot. Yeah. There are winners, there are losers, there are, there's profit. So we have <laughs> Subplots that assist, right? Subplots that uh, provide resources. And we have subplots with character arcs. Are there any other kinds of subplots? Are there subplots that, that raise the stakes? Right? Yeah. Can we just uh, like subplots that do things? Is that? Uh, well, um... yeah. it's pretty broad. Um, subplots that drive the plot. Oh, good. Yeah, I liked it. Um, subplots can drive the plot, especially with the example of the antagonist. Yeah, yeah. And this is the very thing that is creating obstacles to the story resolution. And therefore, we are seeing its development on the other side um, from the person with the opposing agenda. Okay. And that raises tension. Yeah. And I think once you've raised tension in a subplot, you are giving yourself a little leeway on momentum. Yeah. Because there's there's like true momentum where things are really moving along and then there's perceived momentum. This is just something yes. that may or may not be true, but a perceived momentum of where it's so tense and it's so, I am so curious about what's going to happen that even though they're taking a long time to tell me, yeah. I'm turning the pages faster. Yeah. And so the subplots that add that kind of tension, you get a little bit of a pass on for momentum. That's right. So, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'm going to just hit on one more thing that I want to talk about, which I think is a question everybody's going to come up with, which is sort of like, how do I put them into my writing? Uh, do they have to grow organically? Are there techniques? I mean, like, like and, and so talk about how you develop subplots. Do they have to come up organically? Do you ever be like, I need one? Um, 
I almost always plan out subplots in advance. I want to I want to know when I start what kind of story is this? Okay. Um, who are the really important characters and will they have a subplot? Um and uh, so it's always planned out in my books and uh, the thing that uh changes organically for me is once I've written a whole bunch of scenes, I realize that I've, I've got the weaving out of order and I change it. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it has to be a certain way, obviously for temporal reasons, but, but other, other times, um, no, this should come first. Here's a great opportunity to foreshadow if I had this come first or these kinds of tweaks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it begs the question of um, if I didn't want to do a whole bunch of rewriting, can you can you plan the weave? <laughs> uh, you know, I think yeah. you can tentatively plan it. I mean, if if you're doing any kind of an outline or or uh, scene list or um, you can you know cast on a way it could go. As a, as a default, uh, if nothing else, this. And maybe even this will be my first draft. This is how it's going to go. And then, then you learn. Yeah. And then just by looking at your finished list of scenes, you could say, oh my gosh, I've got six, and this is really <laughs> silly in a way, but oh my gosh, I've got six scenes in a row from this character. Maybe we break that up a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, you don't want the scenes, the scene progressions to be in such a block that the main, that the reader tends to forget about your subplots. So you, you need to keep them welling up in the pool. Don't you agree? I mean, I agree. and you know, after 80 pages, who is that guy again? <laughs> Well, and that's one of the joys of writing is, is that you do surprise yourself periodically. And you're like, oh, it's that guy, right? And, and you forget having, I mean, at least I cannot keep the whole book in my head. So it's perpetual sort of coming back and like, oh, look at that. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I tend to do a beat sheet yeah. for my stories. So they're very detailed in planning. And if I had a lot of subplots, I think it would be especially helpful to do that. Although your way of, of putting little cards in order is just another way of doing an outline. You know, you've got, you, there's this uh, idea for a scene on each card. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, I think one says irritated ship acts out because it's an intelligent spaceship and it's been very irritated. <laughs> so, I'm going to close things down. Uh, this has been awesome. And uh, if I learned some things, thank you, Kat. I, that's why we wanted to do it. We could talk it out and learn stuff. And I uh, also wanted to mention to people that Kay is teaching amazing classes for the Rambo Academy. So if you want a chance to ask questions, signing up for them is a really good way to do it. And I will have the link in the description of the video. So thank you, Kay. Thanks, I, uh, Kat. Stopping recording now.